All right, so it obviously wouldn't be build if I didn't talk about AI. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our AI infrastructure. Of course, this could take a whole session on its own. In fact, if you haven't seen it, there was a mechanics video that we uh, posted yesterday where I'd go under the hood with Jeremy Chapman about our AI supercomputer infrastructure. I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail here about certain aspects of our AI infrastructure. And I'll start by talking about our, our Bing serving platform. Because a lot of people are in the misconception that all Bing chat is doing is serving up GPT-4 for you to interact with. But there's a whole lot that we do under the hood to create a service like that. And it starts with our foundational infrastructure on top of that hardware, which includes the GPUs from NVIDIA, AMD, and others, as well as our CPU infrastructure. On top of that is an AI workload-aware scheduler called Project Forge, formerly called Singularity, if you've seen me talk about that before. And then there's services that manage that capacity, inference serving, which maps user requests down to particular GPUs. And above that is where the models are being deployed. So models like GPT-4, GPT-3.5, GPT-3, other variations of GPT-3, fine-tuned models are all managed by this layer, which we've developed in collaboration with OpenAI. In the case of Bing Chat, it's, of course, GPT-4, and that's what I'm focusing on right here. And you can see some of the components, microservices we've worked on with them, including things like a key value cache that lets us swap different users on top of the same GPUs by keeping their state cached on those servers. And then above that is more Azure machine learning infrastructure, as well as the Bing infrastructure that takes user requests and sends them down into the models and does things like admission control and managing global capacity of the deployment of these models. I mentioned Project Forge, and Project Forge is really aimed at making the most use of these expensive GPU resources. We don't want people at Microsoft or anywhere else to get a GPU, and when they're not using it, for that GPU to sit idle. So the entire goal of Project Forge is how can we keep those GPUs as close to 100% utilization, even if a workload that's using it goes idle or shuts down. And it, one of the benefits, too, or goals of Project Forge, is trying to make sure that those workloads that are using GPUs operate successfully and without hum any need for human intervention. If you take a look at a run here, this is actually a run that just finished yesterday on Project Forge. I haven't updated the slide. It was running for over 15 days. It actually finished in 18 days on 1,024 GPUs, A180 gigabyte GPUs. And you can see during that timeline, there's been several failures. Now, Project Forge handles all those failures without human intervention required, diagnoses them, recovers the workload, restores from checkpoints, and moves on. Project Forge actually is a globally aware resource scheduler. It abstracts hardware. It also creates a pool of capacity from all the AI resources that we've got around our regions around the world. And what that allows is for individual users, whether it's an application or an individual data scientist, to have what's called a virtual cluster rather than a physical cluster that they might sit on. Because it's a virtual cluster and Project Forge supports priorities, it means that they can get deployed on available GPU capacity wherever it happens to be, assuming it meets their data residency and other latency requirements. And if a higher priority workload comes in, they might get evicted, but they might get moved to capacity someplace else if the workload that's evicting them has to be in that particular location. So with this and other care features of Project Forge, we can get to close to 100% utilization, including the failure recovery that I talked about. One of the ways that we're exploring to increase efficiency is through something called transparent checkpointing. Now, with transparent checkpointing, the idea here is that we can take a machine learning training job and capture its state without the developer having to do anything. Most of the time today, if an AI developer wants their job to be able to tolerate a failure without losing a lot of work, they've got to code in checkpointing code into their model code. What that checkpoint does is periodically save the state of the model as it's being trained, such that if a server fails, that particular work, worker that was on that server can go back to the previous checkpoint, and the whole job picks up from there. 
And a checkpoint might happen. The programmer might put in code to checkpoint it every 15 minutes or so. With thread -tread checkpointing, developer doesn't have to write any code. And that means that at runtime, Singularity can automatically checkpoint the job according to whatever the developer has said they want to whatever frequency they say they want. And that frequency might be a cost versus cost of checkpointing versus cost of lost work in the face of a failure kind of calculation that they make. Transparent checkpointing in Singularity works by using a, a feature of Linux called CRIU, Checkpoint and Restore in User Mode. That CRIU checkpoint checkpoints the state on the CPU. But the big innovation here is Singular, sorry, Project Forge, Project Forge's way that it can checkpoint the state on the GPU as well. And we accomplished this by partnering with NVIDIA and AMD to, to write CRIU code for the GPUs. But Project Forge has to do more than just checkpoint these two states. It has to make sure that they're coordinated, that the state it captures is consistent across the GPU and the CPU, and not just that, but consistent across all the servers in a cluster, which can be hundreds or thousands of them. Project Forge takes care of this automatically and deals with all the forms of parallelism, data model operator parallelism or pipelining parallelism that AI machine learning models use for efficiency. It does this consistency and understands what the workload is doing with something we call a device proxy. So if you take a look, there's the CPU address space, there's the accelerator, and the device proxy slides in the middle and intercepts all the calls from the AI job through a device proxy client in the container, because this is a containerized serverless uh, platform, goes through the device proxy, and at that point, it knows exactly what memory on the GPU is relevant for that particular worker. It also understands when there's barriers happening, when there's communication happening, and so it can find the right places to create consistent checkpoints. So one of the questions that we had is, this device proxy, this transparent checkpointing is fantastic. How much overhead is it going to introduce? So we've run some measurements, and this is from a published paper on Project Forge called Singularity. And you can see almost no overhead. In fact, there's some funny numbers in there. Does anybody spot some funny numbers when it comes to overhead? There's some negative overhead numbers in there, which you might be saying, OK, so what's up with the negative overhead? The negative overhead is actually a side effect of the fact that some of the uh, PyTorch APIs are synchronous in nature, or in, and the CUDA APIs are synchronous in nature when Project Forge actually takes and converts them into asynchronous APIs underneath the hood. What that means is that it opportunistically will return a success to the model, the training job, which will proceed. If there is actually a failure later in that API call that then the device proxy makes, it'll surface that back up to the model at a later point in time. And that's how you get these negative performance numbers. Let's go take a look at one of my favorite capabilities that's coming with transparent checkpointing in Project Forge. And that is checkpointing in a Jupyter Notebook. How many of you have used a Jupyter Notebook on top of a GPU? If you're like me, I got so frustrated taking Coursera deep learning classes when I'd walk away from my Jupyter Notebook, come back, the cells look like they're alive, but they don't work anymore. And that experience looked a little like this. Here I've got MinGPT, open source AI training notebook from the web. I'm going to execute a bunch of cells. And you can see one of the cells defines this trainer object. Now I'm going to restart the kernel. The next cell that depends on that trainer object is actually going to fail. Because I've restarted the cell, and even though it looks like it's got its state, it actually doesn't. Now, with Project Forge's special kernel, I'm going to run a bunch of cells in the notebook. I'm actually going to kick off the training job itself. Now, this training job, if you look at the lower right, you can see GPU utilization and memory, and it's actually going to be fairly low. That's because this is an A180 gigabyte, gigabyte GPU, and that model is extremely small. But you can see it running. And it's going to run for some iterations. And when it completes, what's going to happen is Project Forge sees it go idle and checkpoints the model on the GPU memory. Now, because I'm showing you stuff that's not production yet, I'm going to have to, there's the run at 0%. I'm going to have to run a script to checkpoint the Jupyter Notebook's kernel state itself. 
which I'm doing here. And so now I've checkpointed the GPU and the CPU. I'm going to kill that Jupyter Notebook in Azure Machine Learning Studio. And now I'm going to restart it. Now, under normal circumstances, I'd have the experience you saw first, which is I go back to the notebook. All the cells you know, have their outputs, but they're actually dead. Now, what I'm going to do is restore the Python kernel here, and then reopen that notebook. And at that point, you're going to see that I'm at the cell right after the training job cell. I run it, and no error, it succeeds. What that actually triggers is Project Forge to restore the GPU checkpoint, find one, restore it, and you can see the GPU memory goes up again. And you can see that I got my output, which is sending some prompt queries into that trained model for me to go see how it works. So transparent checkpoint is, I think, going to revolutionize data, the data scientist inner loop when it comes to Jupyter Notebooks.